As you do funerals and things, you realize you're going to be there one day looking up. But I guess you won't be able to see anything. You'll be in heaven looking down. Nobody can prove me, but I think my mom and my dad's watching me today. But what a time it will be. I want to sing that song today. Oh, what a moment. Just think about it, what it'll be like. Oh, what a time will be when we see loved ones there, those who have gone before, eternal joys to share. And oh, what a song when the blood washed throng starts singing a song. The angels cannot sing. Sing it with me if you know it. Oh, what a moment when we see Jesus, when we stand face to face in his embrace and thank him for amazing grace. Oh, what a moment when we see him. Harvest will then be past. We'll no longer gather. Only what's done for Christ is all that will matter. The seeds we have sown will then be made known. What joy shall fill our raptured souls that day. And oh, what a moment, oh, what a moment when we see Jesus, when we stand face to face in his embrace and thank him for amazing grace. Oh, what a moment, oh, what a moment when we see Him, when we see Him, when we see Jesus. Alrighty, tonight, or this morning, open your Bible to Matthew chapter 6, please. Matthew chapter number 6, our text will be verse 19 to verse 24. We're still looking at the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus' longest sermon he preached in the, in the New Testament and, the, and in the Bible. And uh, he's giving us some first century lessons for 21st century living. And Jesus this morning is going to address a subject that in his day and our day is very prevalent. And, uh, he's, and I can imagine in, our, in, our, in, in the crowd that day, there must have been several rich people, must have been several people whose, whose whole desire and whose whole goal in their life was to accumulate more and more and more riches. Because in verse 19, he begins to talk about that very subject. We are living in a culture that we are judged upon what we have instead of what kind of person we are. Uh, the things we have to most people is way more important than our character. We all know people that, that their whole goal, their whole desire is to see how much stuff I can get, how much can I accumulate, how much money, how much things can I, can I get in my life. And we ought to be judged on our character, not on what we possess. And so in Jesus' day, there must have been somebody like that, especially in this crowd, the crowd he's speaking to today. So I want to, before I begin the message, I want to say this. There's nothing wrong with having possessions. Uh, we all ought to want to work and to, and to 
plan and to arrange our life so at least when we die, at least we have something to give to somebody. If it's a nickel, hey, you have something. And so that, that is not wrong at all. Money is not evil at all. It's the pursuit. It's when, it's when your life is, all you want to do is to possess more and more and more. That's when it becomes a problem. And that's what Jesus is going to deal with here in Matthew chapter 16. Uh, look, uh, look in verse 19, please. Matthew 6, verse 19, I'm going to read down to verse 24. The Bible says this, Matthew 6, 19. Jesus speaking, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not, and let me say, cannot break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let me read verse 21 again. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Amen. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. If thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. Verse 24, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. And I want to preach this morning on this subject, where is your treasure? Where is your treasure? Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you today that you've given us this portion of Scripture for us to look at and to apply to our lives and Lord, we're not to be consumed with the things of this world as far as our possessions go. Those things are great and wonderful as you bless us with those. But life is about character. Life's about you. Life's about holiness. Life's about uh, pleasing you in all things. And so this morning I pray that you may take what's said in this place and apply it to our hearts and to our lives so we may be more satisfied, more content Christians. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Where is your treasure? We probably all know somebody who their goal is to get more. I've got a friend, a very good friend of mine, and he's always looking to get rich quick. I mean, he's always got the latest scheme. He's always got the latest plan. And if he can do this for about a month or two, then he'll have more money than he can ever count. And when he calls me on my phone, it's one of those, you know, you hate to take the call. Oh, my goodness, what kind of... Hey, buddy, how you doing? Uh, he always got, you know, I can, he, he's tried, he's tried the construction business, he's tried, he's bought property, and he's developed land, and he, he tries to make just millions and millions of dollars. He's had a landscaping company, he's had construction company, he's, uh, he's even had a, a, a said he was going to try to, with his lawnmower, go down to Warner Robins and get the contract to mow Warner Robins Air Force Base with his lawnmower. Uh, because he hears they pay a lot to mow the uh, military bases. And so he tried that for a while. He tried, uh, of course, building. He's bought and sold houses. He's had a lot of money, and he's lost a whole lot more money. He's lost several houses. He's filed bankruptcy two or three times. He's lost all his possessions. And even his pursuit of wealth and riches, he lost his wife. And he's still out there to make more and more and more money the, the quick and easy way. And so maybe you have somebody that you know like that. I hope not quite so bad. But this guy, my friend, he's lost everything that he has in pursuit of more. And I'll say it again, there's nothing wrong with wealth, nothing wrong with riches. If you work hard and you plan and you prepare and God blesses you with a nice income and have nice things, I say to that, praise the Lord. But your life is not about what you have. Your life is about who you have, and that's Jesus Christ. And so if your life was about making the next dollar or buying the fancy house or the next boat, then there's a problem. Someone asked Donald Trump, Mr. Trump, with all your wealth and all your assets and all your property that you own, what motivates you? And he said this, the next million dollars. Jesus is going to deal with that very subject in this part of the Sermon on the Mount. Notice in verse 19 through, 19 through 21, notice Jesus speaks of the accumulation of treasure. 
The accumulation of treasure, verse 19, Jesus says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He's going to now make a, make a, a, a contrast between treasures on earth and treasures in heaven. First of all, notice the place of our treasure. Jesus says this, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth in verse 20, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. We find, Jesus says, there's two places our treasure can be. And by the way, the choice is ours. We can invest in heavenly things or we can invest in earthly things. And this phrase laid up means this. It means to gather, to lay up, to store up, to keep in a safe place. And so it pictures us taking our treasure in a place where it can be kept in order to gain more and more by that. And we all know what God's saying here. We don't take our paycheck and cash our paycheck and set it somewhere on the, on the, on the table. No, we put our money, we put our, 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 our income in somewhere where we can, we can use it to live our lives by. We don't just throw it around somewhere. We don't just lay it so somebody can come and pick it up. Jesus is saying here, think about the placement of of your treasure. There's two places we can consider, earth or heaven. And we're going to look at later the consequences of both of these choices, and they're very, very different. But most people today, we are laying up our treasures on earth. And we so seldom take thought of things in heaven. Let me ask you this, where is the majority of your treasure today? If it's laid upon this earth, I would suggest you that you take time to enjoy it now because it could be gone just like that. Amen. Consider in Luke 12. Let me turn to Luke 12, and I want to read you a couple verses about the rich man. Luke chapter 12, verse 16 to verse 21. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying... What shall I do because I have no room to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much good laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Let me stop right there. He says to himself, as he is getting his calculator out and figuring out just how much he's worth, and he comes to a, a conclusion, he pushes the equals mark, and lo and behold, this man is worth a lot. So he says to himself, I've got it made in the shade. I've got all a man could ever want. I mean, look, my barn is so full, I've got to tear down my barn and build a bigger barn just to keep all of my harvest in. Boy, I'm doing something right. I sure am a smart man. I've invested wisely. I've planned properly. I've worked, and I've accomplished and accumulated so much stuff. Just look at my barn. It's so full. And he says to himself, Self, me and you are all right. We're secure. We've got it covered. Uh, any problems come our way, we've got it handled because look how full our barn is. Now look in verse, at the end of verse 19. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. When, when he looks at what he possesses, it's then and only then is he merry. And look in verse 20. But God showed up. And God busts his bubble. Look at verse 20. God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. This rich man thought he had it made, was sitting back counting his money was sitting back taking an inventory of all the things he possessed and thought he had everything. He thought he had it made in the shade, drinking lemonade. Thought he had everything secure and handled. And then wouldn't you know it, God happens to show up and ruin the party. He says this, yes, sir, I see your barns. 
I see how full your barns are. But think about this. Tonight you're going to die, dude. And then who's all this stuff going to be? And so Jesus is saying this. Don't look at your stuff. Look at your relationship with God. Because you may die today. And if you die today, all of your accomplishments, all of your accumulations, all of the stuff that you've been planning for and working for and striving for, and your life is all about getting more stuff in your barn so you can build a bigger barn, and one day you're going to be dead and somebody else is going to have all that stuff. Jesus says this, thou fool. Thou fool. It's his way of saying this. If that's what makes you happy, you're foolish. The word Mary in our text, well, in Luke chapter uh, 16, or chapter 12, the word Mary there means content. Content. Someone said this, Treasure laid up on the earth cannot be taken with you to the grave. It will be left for someone else to enjoy. So be content with a normal life and a normal-sized barn. The placement of our treasure. And notice number two, the possession of our treasure. Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not and cannot and will not break through nor steal. Notice a couple of places where we think about our treasures. First of all, think about earthly treasures. Jesus says this, those things in life that we possess, they, they, they can suffer ruin and they can suffer robbery. Our stuff can be rusted up, our stuff can be eaten with, by moths, and with, with, with an exception of just a few elements on this earth, everything on this earth will either rot or rust or be destroyed. The treasures of this earth will not last. They're only temporal. By the way, even you say, well, I've got a lot of gold. Well, somebody's going to try to steal that gold one day. All that we accumulate down here will fade away or be left behind. There's also heavenly treasure. These are the things that, uh, that do not suffer the same consequences. Uh, investments we make heavenly, they will not rust, they will not rot, and nobody can destroy or steal those things. Heavenly treasure is not subject to decay. Heavenly treasure is not subject to be stolen. There's nobody in heaven going to steal your investment. Nobody in heaven going to steal what you've invested uh, with the Lord. And all that you lay up in heaven one day uh, is going to last from here until all of eternity, long after the things on earth have been destroyed and burnt and corrupt and ruined, what's in heaven is going to last forever. So let me say, where is your treasure? The Lord's dividends pay far better than Wall Street could ever pay. Notice the priority of our treasure. Verse 21. Man, what a verse. This verse just, I mean, ought to speak to all of our heart. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you want to know what somebody's passionate about, if you want to know what motivates somebody, just find out how they spend their time. If their time is spent, like my friends, on chasing the next dollar or chasing the next investment or chasing the next way to get rich quick, listen, if that's where their pursuit is, then that's all they're ever going to have. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Every second of his day, he spends thinking about a way to get more. And I just want to say to him, I just want to say, dude, haven't you lost enough trying to get rich? Uh, I can understand losing houses and losing, uh, losing uh, equipment and losing property. I can understand that, but I cannot understand the man whose desire is to be rich and all he wants is to be rich at the expense of his wife. His marriage was ruined. He's a Christian. He no longer goes to church. 
his placement, his possessions, his priority, and his treasure is all wrong. What did Jesus say? Thou fool. Thou fool. The accumulation of treasure. Notice number two, the assessment of treasure. Look back in verse 22 of Matthew 6. A couple of interesting verses here. Verse 22, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If, there darkness, if, dar if therefore the light is that is in thee uh, be darkness, Jesus says, how great is the darkness. The assessment. Jesus now is going to deal with how we view our treasure. In verse 23, he talks about the, the single eye. The light of the body is the eye, if therefore thine eye be single. That word single means in this text, it means that which is good and pure and perfect and true and righteous. Talking about how we view things. If you view, view things from a single eye, if you view, view things not by one eye, but by the eye that, that is pure, the eye that's holy, the eye that's good, the eye that's true, the eye that's righteous, you'll see things a whole lot differently. It speaks of considering in their proper perspective the things of life. It's the same idea as in Acts 2.46. The Bible says this, And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. The single eye is the pure eye, the holy eye, the righteous eye. With the single eye, we see things that God, the way God wants us to see things. Notice the discretion of the single eye. If our eye be single, Jesus says, then our whole body will be filled with light. If our eye, if our vision, if our motivation, if our desire is on things which are holy and things which are righteous and things which are pure, then it will affect our whole body. When we see things the way God sees things, it will affect our whole body. It will affect our lifestyle. It will affect the way we go to work, the way we come home. It will affect everything about us if we view things with the single eye, the holy eye, the righteous eye. But, Jesus says... There's also, there's a single eye, there's also in verse 23, a sinful eye. Verse 23, but if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? He, he, Jesus mentioned the single eye, the holy eye, the pure eye, the, the righteous eye. And he, here he's going to deal with the sinful eye. And notice what he calls it, evil. The, the, the eye, or if you will, the lifestyle, the, 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 the way you live your life, if it's all about possessing and having and getting more and obtaining more and, and getting more and more and more, Jesus says that's evil. Your vision is distorted. We may recognize what God wants in our life, but we don't possess that righteous eye. We see things the way the world sees things instead of the way God sees things. And so he talks about this distorted vision. He talks about the darkness. With the single eye, with the holy eye and the righteous eye, when we, when we, when we want to please God and live holy and righteously and godly and, and have God's favor in our life, God says that's a good thing and your whole body is filled with light. But if your goal in your life and your, and your motivation and your desire is to possess more and more and have more stuff, Jesus says you're full of darkness. Nothing about your life is going to be right if you love that pursuit of riches and, and, and money and things like that. It's darkness, Jesus says. And when the light is removed, all that's left is darkness. Simply said, darkness and light cannot coexist. That's a dangerous place, place for a Christian to live in. To have a desire to want to see how much wealth and how much riches you can leave this earth with. 
What's this mean? A single eye filled with light will view treasure the way God views treasure. The single eye will see the will of God in every situation. The single eye will will prevent greed, will prevent envy, will prevent a lack of compassion. A single eye will allow ourselves to give for the good of other people, but the evil eye only wants and only desires and only demands what the flesh wants and will do whatever it takes to possess that, even if it means losing your wife. We'll never be content with the treasure we already have if we're looking through the wrong eye. Finally, notice in verse 24, notice the allegiance to treasure. Jesus says this. Man, what a verse. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Notice the the preference. Jesus says this, no man, no woman, no teenager, no child, nobody, nobody can serve two masters. You can't You can't cut yourself in half and have half your body serve one thing and the other half of your body serve the other thing. You can't live your life Monday through Saturday living and serving one thing and come to church on Sunday and serve another thing. You just can't do that. It's not me speaking. It's not the psychiatrist or the psychologist or the doctor speaking. It's Jesus saying. He says it cannot be done. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve two masters because... If you try, you'll love one so much that you despise the other. Or you'll love him so much, you'll despise the other. Jesus says it cannot be done. No man can serve two masters even though we try. We try. We can't pledge our allegiance to both heavenly treasure and earthly treasure. Because we'll love heavenly treasure enough like we should that we despise earthly treasure. But the problem is we love earthly things so much that it causes us to despise the things of God. Jesus said that. You cannot serve two masters. The preference. You cannot, Jesus says. Because we'll give ourselves to one thing and forget about the other thing. But you'll say this. Well, I've worked hard. I've saved up. I've, uh, I've accumulated. I've sweated. I've planned. I've done this and I've done that. So why can't I have earthly treasure? Listen, you can. And I hope you all do. I hope you all retire with $100 trillion in the bank. I hope you all do that. Wouldn't that be good, Brother John? be awesome. And I hope you leave our church in your will. Be awesome. There's nothing wrong with having things, but the problem comes when all we want is things, and all we want is money, and all we want is wealth. Jesus says you can't serve two masters. Notice the prejudice. Or else you'll hold to the one and you'll despise the other. Remember when I was a little kid, I used to collect baseball cards. And I, I, had, I had the whole 1987 Tops set. You know thing about baseball cards? That's got, um, that's got Mark McGuire before steroids. His rookie card in there. It's got some good cards in there. And I remember I, I, back, back in the day, I don't think you could buy a whole set. I think you had to buy little packs and, and accumulate the whole set. Well, I did that one summer. Every penny I had, I went towards baseball cards. That was my treasure. I loved it. And I remember I had the 87 top set. I'd lay them out on the ground. I'd put my Cardinals over here all by myself. That was my favorite team back in the day. And I'd lay them out like here's the left fielder, the center fielder, the right fielder. I loved that 87 top set. I mean, I gave my whole summer's worth of, uh, of chores and allowance to get this top set. It must have been 25 or 30 bucks back in the day. I loved it. But then guess what happened? 
1988 Topps set came out. As much as I love the 87 top set, boy, I despised it now because I love this 88 top set. I couldn't serve both masters. I had to choose. So I chose to serve the 88 top set. And I despise the 87 top set. Here's what I'm saying. Uh, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You can serve two gods. You can't serve God and money. You can't serve God and things. You can't serve God and possessions because somebody is going to play second fiddle. Somebody is going to be despised. Somebody is going to be left behind. And I sure hope that we never leave God behind. And as long as we're serving Him and trusting Him and investing in Him, the things on earth will despise and look forward to the day where we're with Him forever and ever and ever. Jesus says, or else you'll hold to the one and despise the other, and he sums it up in verse 24, ye cannot serve God and mammon. Folks, it gets no simpler than that. Either we're serving God or we're not. You can't serve God a little bit and serve something else the rest of your time. If that's the case, you're not serving God. You cannot serve God and mammon. Jesus said, because something is going to dictate your life. Something's going to motivate you. Something's going to control you. Something's going to cause you to have a desire to wake up in the morning and live your day for God. Something's going to motivate you. What is it? Is it God or is it mammon? Jesus says you can't serve both. You can't. And I don't know about you, but I want my life, I want to be so surrendered to the Lord that nothing's going to stand in the way uh, between him and me. I don't want to serve mammon. I want to serve God. I don't want the things of this life to get, to get me and to get us so bogged down where we're always thinking about getting more things and more stuff. I don't want to have that way. I don't want to serve the God. I don't want to serve mammon. I want to serve God. And Jesus says, you can't serve both. He says, it's up to you. You choose. Let me close with this. You remember in Luke 18, the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said this, What can I do to inherit eternal life? Let me read it to you. I don't want to misquote it. Mark, uh, Luke chapter 18. <clears throat> verse, verse 18. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master... What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There, uh, none is good save one, that's God. Thou knowest the, rec uh, the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not kill, <clears throat> do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And here's what the rich young ruler said. He said, All these things I've kept from my youth up. I've, I've done those things. I've not committed adultery. I've honored my parents. I've not stolen. I've not, st I've not uh, killed. I've not done any of these things that you're talking about. I've not even lied, he says. And Jesus heard these things. He said unto him, verse 22, Luke 18, 22, Yet thou lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. He goes to the Lord and says, Lord, what can I do to be saved? What can I do to have a relationship with you? What can I do so I can serve you? And uh, it's almost like he says this, if I keep the commandments, then can I serve you? And Jesus says, uh, Jesus says that's not quite enough. Your pursuit is in the wrong area. Jesus doesn't literally mean in order to be, a, to be saved, you have to sell your stuff and give to the poor. He doesn't say that. It's not what that means. But what he's saying is this. You can't serve your money and your stuff and your things and me at the same time. It's not possible, Jesus says. And the, and the rich young ruler, he left that day. He was very sorrowful of heart because he had so much to lose. He worshipped his stuff 
which kept him from being able to worship God. Let me ask you this, and I'm done. Where's your treasure? Where's your treasure? Please stand. We'll bow for prayer, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed for just a second, just a second. Where's your treasure? Where's your treasure? Maybe this morning God spoke to you.